Make us feel right at home. Show of hands, how many people are here to heckle? Ah, I feel so yeah, relaxed right now. I got that, the hecklers in my seat. Egypt or Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're ready to go. If you haven't checked out Egypt's uh, um, amazing chess, you can also use the. Hello. Oh, great. Wonderful. <laughs> That's not how you're supposed to test mics, is it? Oh, all right. Well, everybody, thank you for coming to the Metasploit Town Hall number four. We've been here for half of DerbyCon. That's amazing. Like, hooray! Thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm gonna go ahead and advance the slides and we're gonna get the show on the road. We got four fine presenters here today. We're going to answer all your Metasploit questions. We're gonna spend a little bit of time today talking about what we did over the last year in Metasploit, what the community did, um, what we all kind of worked together to accomplish and sort of where we're going in the future. Um, we've got a lot of cool stuff in the works. Um, we've got a lot of really fantastic stuff to show, share with you guys today. And I hope you have a lot of interesting questions to ask for us. And of course, lots of interesting heckling to, to throw at us as well. <laughs> Much appreciated. <laughs> um, so I'm Brent Cook. I got Cody Pierce, our uh, product manager, Aaron Soto to my left, and Adam Kamak, our chief um, engineer on the stage tonight. So let's go ahead and get this party started. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, for those of you, for those of you who uh, were at, uh, DEF CON or B-Sides Vegas or follow us on Twitter and our Slack, you've definitely heard us say it's been 15 years of Metasploit and we are super proud to be part of that. Uh, I'm going to emphasize part of that because a big part of that has been the community. Uh, given the 15 year uh, anniversary now, it's been a great time for us to kind of pause and look back and see that we've had literally over 550 uh, contributors so far. Our uh, GitHub counter broke 10,000, which was exciting for us, maybe not as exciting for everyone else. Oh, I was watching it that whole week. Brent was very excited. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously for those of you who, who have, uh, you know, kind of grown up on Metasploit, you know that there's tons of tutorials and, and videos and things out there where the community is very excited to talk about new features and new exploits, and we'd love to see those. Uh, we have this, this wonderful, very accurate number of one billion shells served. At least 10,000 of those were me arguing with Eternal Blue. <laughs> sure. Uh, but let's kind of look back over the last year. Uh, we've had uh, 230 new modules, and that that's, covers the gamut, but consider that a lot of those have been really uh, impressive exploits that have been powered by the community. So most recently, ALPC and Struts 2. Um, but we've had a lot of really cool groundbreaking uh, work as well. So our first impact module, that's the Python SMB uh, library that now uh, has, has powered uh, a lot of things that uh, are, are giving us opportunities to get into like Eternal Blue. Uh, and then new payloads that are, are running on, on iPhones. So even though the numbers themselves are impressive, the individual contributions themselves are also impressive. And, and with iPhone payloads comes iPhone exploits too. Yes. There's a lot of really cool ones in the works as well. Yeah, so we can kind of drill, keep drilling down a little bit more and we're going to talk about what's really changed uh, since the last DerbyCon, and Brent's going to walk you through that. All right. Yeah, we've had a whole bunch of cool stuff uh, land in Metasploit. Um, one of the things uh, that we really enjoy about coming to DerbyCon is getting to sort of eavesdrop on all the things that people wish Metasploit did, or they're angry that it doesn't do, and that sort of thing. So it gives us a lot of good fodder for, to go back for the next year and, and just kind of sort of set and say, mm, what do people really want out of Metasploit? Uh, one of them actually was, uh, was SOX 5 support. Um, people have been asking for that for, I don't know, a decade, maybe? Just about? It ever said, uh, we're pretty close to like the age of the RFC, I think, on that one. I don't know, right around that. But, uh, but we actually landed that. Um, it has like authentication. It doesn't have UDP support yet, but hey, you guys are the community. Maybe someone can help sort that one out. Um, we've actually done a lot of things uh, as well that, that do kind of tie into the community, things that people have asked us for. I remember Mubik stopping me in the hall and saying, Hey Brent, I love the fact that we have um, SMB named pipe support, but I can't use it if it's reverse. Like there's just there's no way the traffic goes that way. I need bind support so I can maintain persistence. So we implemented bind um, support for, for named pipes. Um, Metasploitable 3, we got so much feedback from people. Metasploitable 3 had over 140 issues filed over the last year. No, not commits, issues from people who couldn't build it. And um, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's one of those things that you know, requires a lot of tooling and a lot of kind of you know, scratching your head when, when Docker or something fails. But we made it so that we actually build that internally in Reference 7. We publish it all out, pre-built for you to just install with one step. So um, hey, Metasploitable 3 now supports Windows and Linux. We pushed all that stuff out. Um, it's really cool. Another thing that people have always told us is like, man, I just, 
I want to convert to Metasploit, but I can't do Ruby. Um, well, here you go. We've added support for Python. We've added support for Ruby in a different way. Ruby, you can actually uh, now run Metasploit with external Ruby modules, which like, you basically run them as external programs, so you can do high-scale high scanners and that sort of thing. And actually, I just pushed today up to the Metasploit repo Golang support. So if you have a module that like, does scanning or something like that, um, you'll actually be able to run a Golang module within Metasploit. Um, it's pretty cool. You should definitely check it out. Um, I think we're up to like 12, 15 Python modules so far. I, I, I stopped keeping track after a while. So, yeah. so there's some really cool stuff in there. Um, and it's, uh, I think, really brought some people in that wouldn't have thought of contributing otherwise. Right. And as we've heard Britton and Aaron talk about, we've been making a large push to incorporate uh, external tools and generally make Metasploit Framework more modular and easier to interact with uh, programmatically. And we're calling all of that Metasploit 5, uh, which we've been working on for the better part of the last year. Um, a large part of that's been external module support. So running things as a subprocess, sort of like your shell does, uh, MSF console now behaves uh, like that. Uh, we're also adding a new RESTful and JSON RPC interfaces for all the things eventually. Uh, right now we're interacting with our data store and soon you'll be able to control framework uh, using an HTTP and JSON, uh, fairly standard type of interface. Um, and we've used that to bring better eternal blue support and a demo. All right, and in and, and addition to that, um, you may have seen also in one of our recent demos, we showed um, MSF Venom NG, which was an MSF Venom that actually starts instantaneously and doesn't have a delay because it actually talks to the RPC server and does everything under the covers. Um, we're hoping to eventually get MSF Console to do the same. So you show the really cool stuff. All right, uh, so this is a little demo of me automatically exploiting a uh, Windows 2012 box uh, using Eternal Blue. So I've got a uh, multi-handler started. It uses the relatively new Meterpreter multi-reverse HTTP handler. So any HTTPS Meterpreter connection or stager that comes in uh, to that handler will automatically be served the correct payload no matter what platform it's on. Um, and so I've got on the right-hand side there a script that is just pulling the JSON interface and you can see the snippet of Python above that. and then the uh, SMB version module, because that's one of the things you always want to scan in a Windows environment, is what SMB can I hit? And as soon as the hosts are added, it, the Eternal Blue was attempted against all of them. Uh, only one was misconfigured, uh, but that's all you need out of the three. And on the bottom there, we're going to import the uh, hash that we'll grab with hash dump uh, into crack map exec using the new uh, JSON interface that's all been set up. If you have a Crack Mac Exec 4 workspace and a Metasploit workspace with the same name, it'll auto import just the creds for that workspace. Um, and so we're adding the cred here. Uh, you still have to do that manually with the creds command. Uh, it's a good area for community improvement though, if you want to get, make that automatic with the hashed up. Uh, but now that we've got that added, we can add that or we can pull that in over the JSON interface into Crack Mac Exec into its SMB store. And then uh, what we'll be able to do is do a fair bit of recon uh, against all the boxes. Since they're on the same network, well, the hash will probably work against all of them. And since it's imported here into the Crack Map Exec database, we don't have to type it out. Uh, or paste it every time we're keeping the clipboard. Uh, we can just patch, uh, the dash I1 flag, uh, to tell it to use cred ID number one. And then we'll pass it in there, uh, for the scanning and for the crack map exec. Some dead time was removed for the sake of the video. But here we're enumerating all the shares. Uh, we see one of them at the top was, uh, a little bit interesting. The super secret share. Um, and so we can go ahead and spider that also using crack map exec, uh, using the same credential because it's what we can do now that we, uh, interface more cleanly with external tools. You don't have to worry about, oh, wait, which module was it again? You can use the tool that you're used to using. And I will note that no CSV files were, were harmed in the making of this video, right? Everything's yep. just talking to each other over Every the same database. Everything. And all of this was just, uh, except for Metasploit, which was talking to the boxes over SMB, was talking JSON over HTTP. 
Yeah, so it's a, kind of our, our overarching plan is to make it easier to integrate the tools that you want to use. Um, if you've got a special tool that you've written on the side, uh, we're making it easy to push data into Metasploit, to pull data out of Metasploit. Uh, the goal here is to make um, Metasploit almost like a, I, I like to use the term meta Metasploit. There I don't go. know, that's meta kind of silly Metasploit. enough. Yeah. Um, thanks for groaning. Um, but uh, <laughs> so the, the, really the power here is that we have kind of a common shared data model that, that is, can be used by all these different tools to achieve um, a single focus, yep. focus goal. And while Metasploit by itself is a great tool, there are lots of other tools and lots here that were presented at DermiCon that are really cool and we can't really hope to implement all of that by ourselves. So we hope we can open ourselves up and that some of the more tedious things about uh, offensive security you can just sort of plug into us and get that. Like, you don't have to store your own credentials anymore. All right, thanks, Adam. All right, I still have feel suspense. And, all right, this is the, the next bit of suspense. I'm excited about this one. So we've been working on a little bit of a surprise. I don't know if anyone's kind of guessed what it is yet. Um, but we've added something that Metasploit hasn't had in a long time. It's something that people have been looking for for a long time. Um, they often try to look for it in various places. Um, in their hearts, <laughs> in evasion, uh, in encoder modules, and I just gave away, we're adding evasion modules to Metasploit. So what an evasion module is, is it basically kind of just faces the facts that evasion is very important in red teaming C2 in, in, in today's modern environment. Um, everyone's got antivirus by default on Windows. Um, a lot of things in Metasploit just get caught. You know, it's, it's just kind of a, a fact of life. And being an open source tool, you off constantly have to evolve, evade, you have to come up with new techniques and new tradecraft. Um, and as we know that it's usually not that hard to create new tradecraft, um, a lot of people have written external tools that, um, that work really great for, for this particular purpose. Um, but there's never been a true way, an official way in Metasploit to actually hook those kinds of things into Metasploit. Um, what we're announcing today, and actually the PR went up 10 minutes before this talk began, is this new evasion module type. Um, Wei Chen's actually been working on it most of the year um, and making sure that um, not only do we have evasion techniques in Metasploit, but because, you know, techniques, they come and go, we want to make it so it's extensible and so you can add your own techniques, you can add your own snippets of code, your own evasion type modules, and maybe keep them as part of your local trade craft or whatever it is you need. And, uh, and that way you can kind of keep them, keep them moving forever. Now we've been testing this module throughout the year against uh, Microsoft's uh, AV products and it's worked for the most part, but you can definitely tell that the, uh, the AI and all that kind of stuff is slowly keeping catching up. And for, so as part of that, uh, we actually put a, a new bonus evasion module, we wrote it last week. Uh, Shelby Pace, one of our, our newest uh, exploit developers, um, she wrote a, a JavaScript evasion module as well. So that, that's also in the, in the, in the, uh, in the payload and so I can actually encode a meta interpreter into, into JavaScript and you can, you can execute it from Windows. Yeah, so as, as I kind of said, there, there's a few different things that, that we have as part of uh, core um, uh, pieces of the, of the toolkit. Um, we have, uh, we've wrapped uh, Metasm in a C compiler wrapper. Um, we've also added all the Windows headers you might need for building shell code, so you don't have to actually do any kind of special work to, to wrap APIs. It's all included in Metasploit. Um, we've added random code generators that let you insert random snippets of code. If you want to add some, some crypto operations or whatever to kind of throw things off, that's in there. Um, we've added some cryptographic methods as well, and of course some silly methods like XOR and XOR stuff, but whenever it's effective, it's effective. And also some interesting new anti-emulation anti functions. Um, specifically, we, we've done some research into how Microsoft specifically emulates the Windows API in ways that it, it can be detected. Um, this is actually all inside of Metasploit now too. Um, of course, this will evolve over time, and so look for updates there. Um, but uh, it's actually some interesting stuff. Um, next Tuesday, uh, we'll be putting out a 20-page white paper that details a lot of the details of how these, these methods work. Um, we don't have enough time for this talk to go into it. It's a whole talk into itself, but definitely check it out. We'll, we'll be talking about it on the web and on Twitter. So we're going to show a demo, and we're going to see if the audio works. I'm going to move the mic instead. Okay. Oh, it's coming out of the literal projector? <laughs> Do we need a mic it? All right. All right, so what we're doing is we're right now we're just kind of setting up the, uh, uh, just talking about how the, uh, the Asia Bayesian modules work, kind of the, the logic behind it. 
Let's we'll see if we can kind of scrub past the introduction. We'll be posting this on our YouTube channel as well, so you can check it out later if you want to look at it in more detail. All right, how far do we want to go? Let's go to where the typing begins. That's close enough. The purpose of evasion module type is to allow users to have um, better pen testing experience against uh, targets that are running antivirus. Uh, for our developers, the new module type allows you to be creative in building a payload, for example, um, using PowerShell, JavaScript, C Sharp, etc. And build it faster. To demonstrate this, demonstrate new, feature, this new feature, I have a module that's mo called Windows Defender EXE. It utilizes things such as encryption, code randomization, and a little anti-emulation to stay undetected on Windows 10. Let me show you. So, here's the code for our evasion module. Writing an evasion module is not like writing a file format exploit. You have access to the payload object that spits out the shellcode for your module to use. But you won't get a handler when you run the module. In this module, the shellcode is encrypted using RC4 with some extra junk at the end. Open process is used to detect Windows API emulation. The compile random C API will compile the source code and keep the binary unique. And finally, this binary will be saved in a local MSF directory. Using an invasion module is pretty similar to an exploit. Uh, in this example, I will load the Windows Defender EXE module and assign the Windows Metributor Reverse HTTPS payload. The HTTPS Metributor gives us an extra protection because it will hide our malicious traffic. Um, HTTPS is an only payload that supports cryptography. Um, there's RC4 too, but uh, HTTPS has been giving me the best experience, so I'll stick to this. And here we go. Now that we have a file, we need to set up a handler. Um, the quickest way for this is by using the handler command like this. After the handler is up and running, we are going to move our evasive payload to the Windows 10 machine and run it. But before that, let's make sure Windows Defender is running. For this demonstration, we have the real-time protection and cloud deliver protection turned on. There's actually another setting called automatic sample submission, but I'm not interested in submitting my payload for Microsoft to flex, so that is disabled. Okay, now let's run the file. Usually with Windows Defender, if a malicious program is detected, it is automatically deleted. If it fails to detect the program, but the program is generating malicious traffic, then Windows Defender will shut down the program. Hopefully, we don't run into any of that. Sweet, and we got a shell. To get this evasion module, look for it in your mouse by framework. And that's it for the video. Thanks for watching. So that's pretty interesting, right? Um, so not only did we manage to evade Windows Defender um, in spite of kind of testing it throughout the year, um, uh, we actually now have a full framework for, for building these kind of modules yourself and another evasive payload that just, just, just went up with the PR today. So check it out today. Um, be excited and let's give another round of applause to Wei. And here's Cody Pierce. He's going to talk about kind of our evolution moving forward. Yeah, I just wanted to spin one, one kind of slide and, and talk about kind of what we're seeing in offensive security. I think it's a really exciting time, but it's a, it's an evolving time. So, you know, we've traditionally at Metasploit been focused on exploits and, 
and uh, payloads and things like that, we've seen not only the penetration testing world kind of change and evolve, but the uh, upcoming red teaming, um, all these different types of attacker um, activities that are going on um, from consultants to actually in the real world. And, and we feel like Metasploit is a great platform for um, continuing to be that, that, um, that foundation that you can build tools on. So not just exploits, but going beyond that, um, going into uh, more um, post-exploit activities like C2, persistence, evasion is a great one. You know, these are all things that you need 80 to 90% of engagements. And we want to make sure that the framework kind of continues to evolve and continues to provide those facilities so that you're able to um, really kind of put your um, expertise and focus on your, you know, um, your goal and let Metasploit abstract everything out. So, you know, logging, collaboration, communication, security, scale, all those types of things, access. I mean, there's so many of them that you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel and you don't want to have to go implement. You just want to do your ev evasion. You want to do your new persistence you found. And we want Metasploit to continue being that framework that you go to and drop in and get value out of. And we're starting to kind of do some of that. A lot of what you saw before was built on our, our, um, our data service and it's all RESTful. So the kind of modernization of some of the, the libraries and whatnot, whether it's a, a RESTful or JSON RPC, really easy. We could show you curl commands and how to just save credentials, get credentials, save payloads, uh, retrieve payloads and all those kind of things. So, um, and again, you know, we love the community. We love the engagement and we want to be the ones that are doing the things that make your life easier so that when you do want to contribute to the framework, it's super simple and uh, really quickly you can get up running and get uh, a lot of value out of it. So we're really excited for Metasploit 5 and some of the things we've shown, but we're going to just keep doing some more of that and keep evolving with all of y'all and, and keep making it easier for y'all to build offensive tools and get, get a lot of that value out of. Excellent. Thanks, Cody. So Metasploit Town Hall wouldn't be a town hall if we didn't kind of redirect things back out to you um, and understand sort of what you guys want to know about Metasploit. Um, what are the questions you might have? What are some things that you'd like to see us uh, do in the future? Um, we kind of did our spiel here. We can, of course, go into more detail on some of the things here, but we'd definitely like to have feedback from, from everyone here. Um, I think what I'm going to do is if anyone has a question, I'll just wander around with this mobile mic and we can just either answer it out in the field or up here. So uh, does anyone have a question? Would anyone like to be the start? Somebody in the back, so Brent has to run. Oh, I got one. Here you go. Have you guys tested this in conjunction with AV and EDR? Or just against Windows Defender? So we have been doing some studies into other AV tools. Um, we actually have ones internal to Rapid7, and we've got ones that we kind of have licenses for. Um, we've had a lot of interesting results. Um, when we have managed to evade various aspects, I would say that things can evolve. Some, one of the problems with, with this kind of research is you'll be like, yes! And then by the time your talk gets around, it's like, oh. <laughs> so um, now that we have actually the module kind of base out there, we'll be able to actually push these kind of things out a little more quickly and kind of hopefully turn around the research more quickly. But to be honest with you, um, I would say that a lot of these things sort of end up being sort of tweaks on the same wheel and, and eventually you, you get it working again. Um, I think uh, Dave Kennedy has actually done some interesting tweeting about when he's updating uh, Unicorn and sort of like, oh, I have to keep creating these files until finally one, one passes again. And then it's, it's a very similar process. It's kind of iterative of, all right, it found that one little thing, tweak, it's, it's fixed again. Um, and of course, a lot of the main effectivenesses of these kind of tools is like, you know, holding it a little bit to the side and then, you know, seeing how long it lasts. So, anyone else have a question? Here you go. So the, the new AV handler, is there any like, from my standpoint, it's like, oh, you've added an extra step to avoid AV. Why not have it? I mean, I don't know if it's possible, but, you know, like a true false in the handler. So you're already loading the handler, and why not just have a true false where you could say, I'm not giving you the microphone. 
you, you know, say set it, set it to true, and then it's used automatically as opposed to having it be some separate thing that you always have to do. Yeah, that's actually the next step is to make it so that evasion is a parameter that you just set. And so if you have a different type of evasion you'd like to load in, that would just basically be a filter between the payload being generated and it actually being sped out. We have talked about adding a, a basically that option to things like file dropper and different things like that where it's actually kind of is relevant. Um, when it's sort of like in-memory uh, injection and that sort of thing, then of course other kinds of evasions may be more appropriate. Um, that'll be the next step, for sure. Any questions kind of in general? Any modules you'd like to see? We had a, a question on Twitter that was um, maybe four or five different parts, um, but I'll, I'll get into that one if uh, there's no other questions right now. No? Okay. Well, one question was, uh, oh, here you go. Brian. This goes back a bit, but I remember talk about um, consolidating our host and our hosts so that, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. No, no, you got so excited. Um, <laughs> I was wondering what's the status on that, and I haven't been looking into the current features in Metasploit in uh, MSF five. So that's in Metasploit five. Okay. So there's always little corner cases, and we've been working through those. We we got the initial patch in to add our hosts to exploits, um, and have probably been fighting it the rest of the year. As far as like, oh no, this little edge case and this little edge case. Egypt was right. Um, it is a hard thing to do um, because you've got all the different architectures, you've got all the different things to, to plan for, that sort of stuff. But um, we're getting there. And um, right now, you can actually run our hosts. You can run any particular exploit against it. And um, it will generally run if you're, like, say, targeting a whole group of MS17010 vulnerable Windows boxes. Perfect, right? It gets a little more tricky when you just like want to just slam a whole subnet with random exploits. Um, you're going to, you basically, you have to apply a little bit of a kind of uh, pre-knowledge, um, but it does work at, at least in kind of the ways that it's sort of designed to work and, the, and most of the ways that people expect it to work. We did also add a loop command recently to Metasploit as well, so you can uh, kind of run the same module over and over again. Um, people also, of course, always write RC scripts and that sort of thing, but, but yeah, you can actually set our hosts and it is actually an alias for our host, so if you forget which way you're going, um, it actually glues the two together. Do you have any hardware modules for super micro boards? <laughs> oh yeah, the, the grain of rice. Um, well, speaking of rice, we might have some modules for a rice cooker, but <laughs> um, it, it is kind of an interesting thing. Um, the, we, we did add the hardware bridge last year, which was designed to talk to things like OBD2 and that sort of thing. Um, it is definitely a topic of interest. We have a, an IoT team within Rapid7 that's doing some of the trying to find this stuff. Personally, I don't know if there's really that much to the super micro story specifically, um, but things like UEFI implants and that sort of stuff certainly are really interesting. Um, and uh, when it comes to like detectability, I think it's going to be an interesting thing for, for um, defenders as well to, to even notice, because this is at the lowest level of, of the system. So I would say probably take it with a grain of salt on the whole chips, you know that. But, uh, but yeah, low level persistence is certainly a thing. Um, I pulled out my old uh, MS DOS uh, virus writing book recently, the little black book of uh, virus writing and you know writing boot sector viruses. Remember those? Kind of the same thing. So anyway, um, keep an eye out. Certainly welcome a PR if you find something. So I have a question. I have a recommendation. I have two heckles. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess the question is a recommendation. I'm going to ask a question, and I know the answer is no. Uh, so, uh, as a as a pen tester, you know, a lot of the times I want to. I mean, if I have any credentials, I mean, one of the things I'll do is you go to LDAP and you enumerate LDAP to get a list of every user, or you enumerate LDAP to get a list of every domain admin, or you know, sure. per se, or you know, whatever it is. And, and the fact that I have to do that outside of Metasploit. And even though, I mean, every place you go is going to have a domain controller and every one of those domain controllers is going to have LDAP that you can authenticate to is, so like, it, it, what would make my job so much easier was that if in Metasploit I could say, you know, log in this, password's this, go enumerate all the users, and then it populates the database of all the users in the database. 
And so there, when I get credentials, then it would auto, it would, you know, say I ran, you know, hash dump or ran Kiwi or uh, Mimic Hats, thank you, uh, that it would then take those, see it, and then auto populate the database with credentials. And so that way, as I go through an entire environment, it's constantly continuing. So if I do show creds, uh, it's 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 pre-populated with information because right now I have to go through LDAP, get all that separately, then go and then dig through it and then go back to Metasploit manually. I, I know that's not the idea of Metasploit, but anyways, I, I pestered HD about that like five years ago. So that that's a question. Like, is that supported? No. Um, so anyways, I would I would love that because that's something. Yeah, you know, sort of sort of doesn't count. Horseshoes, hand grenades, Egypt. <laughs> Okay, so that's my question or my statement. You can. I don't want you. Yeah, well, actually, uh, the, the Kiwi extension added streaming of credentials from LDAP this last year. Um, actually, I can't say any of us can take credit for it. The, uh, OJ did it. So he's been following really closely developments uh, of Mimikatz and been really keeping Meterpreters, Mimikatz extension, really up to date. In fact, I think it's no more than a couple weeks out um, right now. We keep it in a separate repo. We have like all the uh, little USB light blinky things turned off and that sort of stuff, but, um, which was kind of a funny little trick you pulled. But, um, uh, so yeah, we've been keeping Mimikatz up to date and there is a streaming API that lets you actually stream LDAP results from Kiwi right into Metasploit's credential API. Um, because we also created this new open database that you can just push data right in, I'd say, tell me what tool you use today to pull LDAP creds. We can probably integrate it right into the database because now the database actually runs as a standalone daemon and you can actually push data straight into it over HTTP. So if there's a tool that you, we can modify to push data in, just like crack Mac exec, um, we can modify it to, to work with Metasploit and, and not have to have an intermediate copy paste kind of thing going on. Oh yeah, I'll take a heckle. So is there any truth to the fact that uh, Metasploit's gonna be re rewritten in Python again, or, or is it PowerShell? Metasploit's gonna be written in Golang, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? <laughs> no, that's a good one. Oh, I got one in the back. Uh, Metasploit, like on Kali and on the install, still, still defaults to version 4. When is version 5 going to be the default? End of the year. So one of the problems that we've kind of had with, with uh, Metasploit development is it's really hard to make big new features that have maybe some intermediate times when things are less stable without people going, oh no, it's broken. And so for, for a lot of the, the past, I've been with Metasploit for four years, and a lot of times we had a lot of hesitation to, to do big things because there was a lot of risk involved. You know, you, you get a bad thing, it goes into a Kali build, then you get like, you know, 20 tickets, they're like, oh no, you broke this module, whatever. And sometimes it still happens, right? It's, it's a big project. But to kind of minimize the risk and give us a little bit more time to stabilize things, we actually asked the Kali Linux dis distribution, can you please, please stick to the 4.x branch for this year? And um, if you go look into the Kali distri uh, bug tracker, there's, there's a discussion there where we asked them, please hold on to this. And that then also feeds Parrot, Sec, and a bunch of other OSs. And even our own builds that we put out have been 4 to X. Um, very soon we're going to be getting um, 5 to X uh, nightly builds pushed out so you can try out the dev versions um, as part of our own Omnibus installer build. And um, we're hoping by the end of the year we'll get 5.0 out and then we'll switch over to 5.1 development and basically go to like kind of a, a mixture of stable branch plus big feature branch um, each year. So that's, that's our plan moving forward. But you can check it out and get right now if you, if you want to really set it up. And hopefully the dev packages will be out soon. Get pulling it. Sorry, can you repeat the question? What's, What's the best way to install Metasploit 5 right now? Grab it from the source tree. Master is 5.0. Five to X. I got another question over here. Uh, what is the process to accept a PR? Would one of you guys like to take this one? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, sure. So the most important thing in getting a PR accepted is finding someone that has time to land it or is interested enough to find time to land it. Um, we have a contributing.md file in the repo that goes through all the steps to get uh, the PR uh, mechanically correct so that it doesn't take us a long time and lots of back and forth uh, to find it. Um, but as long as it's open source and you're responsive to our uh, suggestions, uh, that's pretty much all that's required. Uh, you sometimes do have to ping, if you know an individual contributor or someone who's touched uh, part of the code that you're interested in modifying, uh, that definitely doesn't hurt. Yeah, so find someone to help you kind of shepherd it through. Um, we also have a lot of great ways to get feedback on your module before you PR it or even during the process, so it's a little bit less of a kind of a, you know, a slow motion w within GitHub, although GitHub is pr usually pretty, I don't know if you've ever subscribed to our GitHub channel as far as like the amount of conversation that happens there. I get like 4,000 messages a week in my inbox on that. Um, but uh, we have a Slack team. We also have an RC channel. They're hooked together. So you can talk between the two, um, and uh, you can definitely ask questions there as well. Hey, hey, Bryn, let me add to that real quick. One, one of the goals that we want um, with this evolution is to make it very, very easy to contribute. So no longer do you have to learn Ruby if that's not your, your language of choice. Please submit modules and, and, and other um, things that are non-Ruby because we have a new interface. We're going to be updating documentation and, and helping the onboarding process of being a contributor very, very easy and, and frictionless. And, you know, hopefully we'd love to be able to, you know, have people become contributors in, you know, five, 10 minutes, at least get the PR up there. And uh, then we can optimize the time to actually get it merged. But we certainly are going to be, you know, investing in helping everybody contribute and get that PR in and make it um, less about deciding which language you want to use or, uh, you know, about that and really focus on the idea and get it up uh, quickly. And maybe one last note, I'd say one of the best ways to learn how to submit a PR is to look at the existing PRs. Look at, look at how they, how they, how the flow is. Look at the problems that people run into. Um, contribute. Check one out and see if you can test it. That helps us so much, um, with regards to moving things forward. So, that's it. Uh, any other questions? Oh, I got one here. What functionality is going to be exposed via the RESTful interface? You know, will, will I be able to like launch a module and you know do all that type of stuff? Is it more just kind of shoving information into the database to then use you know later? So the idea is that everything will be exposed. Um, so we currently have an RPC interface that uses HTTP and message pack, and from that you can select modules and launch payload, uh, generate payloads, launch modules. Um, and we are in the middle of getting that ported over to HTTP and JSON. We actually got it ported. Oh, is that so landed? the whole, the whole one.o API is now exposed via JSON RPC. All right. Um, the backend data model is a RESTful interface that we've also got documented. Um, you can actually launch the server and look at the documentation online. It, it builds it automatically. And we're actually working on kind of simultaneously a, a 2.0 API and a 1.1 API. 1.1 is we've been trying to write tools that use Mesploit's API. You were trying to eat your own dog food and, um, uh, we found some deficiencies in places where, oh no, we've left out half the payload modules in the API. So now we're fixing that. Um, but in addition to that, we've been working like a, a new payload API for managing UIDs. I know that when it comes to pin testing and red teaming, tracking your payloads, having encryption, knowing what's coming in, what's leaving is really important. In Mesploit 4, that saves it into a file. It's kind of an obscure feature. We're trying to make that a first class citizen. So we're actually reworking the UIDs so they're fully exposed, and they'll be part of our 2.0 API. But if you check out Mesploit 5 today, you can actually run the 1.0 API right now with curl, rest, everything else. And another thing, it's not a network API. Uh, the external modules can all be run by themselves uh, without the use of Mesploit console. Uh, and that was one of the things in the demo that I sort of glossed over. Uh, but the uh, Windows 8.1, uh, 2012, and 10 uh, targeting uh, Eternal Blue module, uh, runs just fine as a standalone command. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. It's been really great uh, seeing everyone. Uh, we're going to be here through the rest of the weekend, so if you have any specific questions, you want to come and talk to us, you want to hack something together, you want to integrate a module, you want to get Unicorn hooked up as an evasion module or something like that, um, we'll definitely be glad to help. Um, I just wrote the Golang support actually this morning, so um, I'm happy to get some criticism on that also. Um, definitely, uh, we, we really appreciate your time and uh, hope to see you guys again next year um, with a whole lot of cool new stuff to show. Thank you.